Islam Incorporated and the parties of Intersell. I was working for an outfit known as Islam Inc., financed by A.J., the notorious merchant of sex, who scandalized international society when he appeared at the Duke de Ventre's ball as a walking penis covered by a huge condom emblazoned with the A.J. motto, They Shall Not Pass. Rather bad taste, old boy, said the Duke. To which A.J. replied, Up yours with inner zone KY. The reference is to the KY scandal, which was still in a larval state at that time. A.J.'s repartee often refers to future events. He is a master of the delayed squelch. A.J. once reserved a table a year in advance, Chez Robert, where a huge icy gourmet broods over the greatest cuisine in the world. So baneful and derogatory is his gaze that many a client under that withering blast has rolled on the floor and pissed all over himself in convulsive attempts to ingratiate. So A.J. arrives with six Bolivian Indians who chew coca leaves between courses. And when Robert, in all his gourmet majesty, bears down on the table, A.J. looks up and yells, Hey, boy, bring me some ketchup. Thirty gourmets stopped chewing at once. You could have heard a souffle drop. As for Robert, he lets out a bellow of rage like a wounded elephant, runs to the kitchen and arms himself with a meat cleaver. The sommelier snarls hideously, his face turning a strange iridescent purple. He breaks off a bottle of Brut Champagne 26. Pierre, the head waiter, snatches up a boning knife. All three chase A.J. through the restaurant with mangled, inhuman screams of rage. Tables overturn. Vintage wines and matchless food crash to the floor. Cries of lynch him ring through the air. An elderly gourmet with the insane bloodshot eyes of a mandrel is fashioning a hangman's knot with a red velvet curtain cord. Seeing himself cornered in an imminent danger of dismemberment at least, A.J. plays his trump card. He throws back his head and lets out a hog call. And a hundred famished hogs he had stationed nearby rush into the restaurant, slopping the hot cuisine. Like a great tree, Robert falls to the floor in a stroke where he is eaten by the hogs. Poor bastards don't know enough to appreciate him, says A.J. Robert's brother Paul emerges from retirement in a local nuthouse and takes over the restaurant to dispense something he calls the transcendental cuisine. Imperceptibly, the quality of the food declines until he is serving literal garbage, the clients being too intimidated by the reputation of Chez Robert to protest. Sample menu. The clear camel piss soup with boiled earthworms. The filet of sun-ripened stingray basted with eau de cologne and garnished with nettles. The afterbirth supreme de boeuf, cooked in drain crankcase oil, served with a piquant sauce of rotten egg yolks and crushed bedbugs. The Limburger cheese sugar cured in diabetic urine, doused in canned heat, flamboyant. So the clients are quietly dying of botulism. Then A.J. returns with an entourage of Arab refugees from the Middle East. He takes one mouthful and screams, Garbage, goddammit! 
Cook this wise citizen in his own swill. Manhattan Serenade. A.J. and Entourage start into a New York nightclub. A.J. is leading a purple-ass baboon on a gold chain. A.J. is dressed in checked linen plus fours with a cashmere jacket. Manager. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's that? A.J. It's an Illyrian boodle. Choicest beast a man can latch on to. It'll raise the tone of your trap. Manager. I suspect it to be a purple-assed baboon, and it stands outside. Stooge. Don't you know who this is? It's A.J., last of the big-time spenders. Manager. Leave him take his purple-ass bastard and big time spend someplace else. A.J. stops in front of another club and looks in. Elegant fags and old cunts, God damn it, we come to the right place. Avanti, Rigatti! He drives a gold stake into the floor and pickets the baboon. He begins talking in elegant tones, his stooges filling in. Fantastic! Monstrous! Utter heaven! A.J. puts a long cigarette holder in his mouth. The holder is made of some obscenely flexible material. It swings and undulates as if endowed with loathsome reptilian life. A.J., so there I was, flat on my stomach at 30,000 feet. Several nearby fags raised their heads, like animals scenting danger. A.J. leaps to his feet with an inarticulate snarl. You purple-ass cocksucker, he screams. I'll teach you to shit on the floor. He pulls the whip from his umbrella and cuts the baboon across the ass. The baboon screams and tears loose the snake. He leaps on the next table and climbs up an old woman who dies of heart failure on the spot. A.J., sorry, lady, discipline, you know. In a frenzy, he whips the baboon from one end of the bar to the other. The baboon, screaming and snarling and shitting with terror, Climbs over the clients, runs up and down the bar, swings from drapes and chandeliers. A.J., you'll straighten up and shit right or you won't be in a condition to shit one way or the other. Stooge, you ought to be ashamed of yourself upsetting A.J. after all he's done for you. A.J., ingrates, every one of them ingrates. Take it from an old queen. Salvador has an O'Leary, alias the shoe store kid, alias wrong way Marv, alias after birth Leary, alias Slunky Pete, alias plus sense of Juan, alias K.Y. Ahmed, alias El Chinche, alias El Culito, etc., etc., for 15 solid pages of dossier. First tangled with the law in New York City, where he was traveling with a character known to the Brooklyn police as Blubber Wilson, who hustled his goop ball money, shaking down fetishists in shoe stores. Hessen was charged with third-degree extortion and conspiracy to impersonate a police officer. He had learned the shake man's number one rule, D. Ditch Tin, which correspond to the pilot's KFS, keep flying speed. As the vigilante puts it, if you get a rumble, kid, ditch your piece of tin if you have to swallow it. So they didn't bust him with a queer badge. Uh, Hassan testified against Wilson, who drew pen in death. Longest term possible under New York law for a misdemeanor conviction. Nominally, an indefinite sentence 
It means three years in Rikers Island. Hassan's case was nolly prosy. I'd have drawn a nickel, Hassan said, if I hadn't met a decent cop. Hassan met a decent cop every time he took a fall. His dossier contains three pages of monikers indicating his proclivity for cooperating with the law. Playing ball, the cops call it. Others call it something else. Abe the fuzz lover, Finky Marv, the crooning Hebe, Ellie the stool, Rongo Cell, the wailing Spick, the shinny soprano, the Bronx Opera House, the copper gin, the answering service, the squeaking Syrian, the cooing cocksucker, the musical fruit, the wrong asshole, the fairy pink, Leary the narc, the lilting leprechaun, grassy girt. He opened a sex shop in Yokohama, pushed junk in Beirut, pimped in Panama. During World War II, he shifted into high, took over a dairy in Holland, and cut the butter with used axle grease. Cornered the KY market in North Africa. And finally hit the jackpot with slumps. He prospered and proliferated, flooding the world with cut medicines and cheap counterfeit goods of every variety. Adulterated shark repellent, cut antibiotics, condemned the parachutes, stale anti-venom. Inactive serums and vaccines leaking lifeboats. Ever dig the Mayan codices? I figure it like this. The priests, about 1% of the population, made with one-way telepathic broadcasts, instructing the workers what to feel and when. A telepathic sender has to send all the time. He can never receive... Because if he receives, that means someone else has feelings of his own, could louse up his continuity. The sender has to send all the time, but he can't ever recharge himself by contact. Sooner or later, he's got no feelings to send. You can't have feelings alone. Not alone like the sender is alone. And you dig there can only be one sender at one place time. Finally, the screen goes dead. The sender has turned into a huge centipede. So the workers come in on the beam and burn the centipede and elect a new sender by consensus of the general will. The Mayans were limited by isolation. Now one sender could control the planet. You see, control can never be a means to any practical end. It can never be a means to anything but more control. Like junk.
The county clerk. The county clerk has his office in a huge red brick building known as the old courthouse. Civil cases are, in fact, tried there, the proceedings inexorably dragging out until the contestants die or abandon litigation. This is due to the vast number of records pertaining to absolutely everything, all filed in the wrong place so that no one but the county clerk and his staff of assistants can find them. And he often spends years in the search. In fact, he is still looking for material relative to a damaged suit that was settled out of court in 1910. The old courthouse is located in the town of Pigeonhole, outside the urban zone. The inhabitants of this town and the surrounding area of swamps and heavy timber are people of such great stupidity and such barbarous practices that the administration has seen fit to quarantine them. In retaliation, the citizens of Pigeonhole plaster their town with signs. Urbanite, don't let the sun set on you here. An unnecessary injunction, since nothing but urgent business would take any urbanite to pigeonhole. Please, case is urgent. He has to file an immediate affidavit that he is suffering from bubonic plague to avoid evictions from the house he has occupied ten years without paying rent. He exists in perpetual quarantine. So he packs his suitcase of affidavits and petitions and injunctions and certificates and takes a bus to the frontier. The urbanite custom inspector waves him through. I hope you got an atom bomb in that suitcase. The door of the county clerk's office is open. The county clerk sits inside gum and snuff, surrounded by six assistants. Lee stands in the doorway. The county clerk goes on talking without looking up. They burned that old nigger over in Cuntlick. Nigger had the aftosin and left him stone blind. So this white girl down from Texarkana screeches out. Roy, that old nigger's looking at me so nasty. Land sakes, I feel just dirty all over. Now, sweet thing, don't you fret yourself. Me and the boys will burn him. Do it slow, honey face, do it slow. He's giving me a sick headache. So they burned the nigger, and that old boy took his wife and went back up to Texarkana without paying for the gasoline. That old whispering Lou runs the service station. Couldn't talk about nothing else all fall. These city fellas come down here and burn a nigger and don't even settle up for gasoline. Lee cleared his throat. The clerk looked at him over his glasses. Now, if you'll take care, young fella, till I finish what I'm a saying, I'll tend to your business. And he plunged into an anecdote about a nigger got the hydrophobia from a cow. So my pappy says to me, finish up your chores, son, and let's go see the mad nigger. They had that nigger chained to the bed, and he was bawling like a cow. I soon got enough of that old nigger. Well, if you all will excuse me, I got business in the privy council. <laughs> Lee listened in horror. The county clerk often spent weeks in the privy, living on scorpions and Montgomery Ward catalogs. On several occasions, his assistants had forced the door and carried him out in an advanced state of malnutrition. Lee decided to play his last card. Mr. Anchor, he said, I'm appealing to you as one razor back to another. And he pulled out his razorback card, a memento of his lush-rolling youth. The clerk 
looked at the card suspiciously. You don't look like a bony, feety, mash-fed razorback to me. What you think about the Jews? Well, Mr. Hanker, you know yourself all a Jew wants to do is doodle a Christian girl. One of these days, we'll cut the rest of it off. Well, you talk right sensible for a city filler. Find out what he wants and take care of him. He's a good old boy. Interzone. The zone is a single, vast building. The rooms are made of a plastic cement that bulges to accommodate people, but when too many crowd into one room, there is a soft plop, and someone squeezes through the wall right into the next house. The next bed, that is. Since the rooms are mostly bed, where the business of the zone is transacted. A hum of sex and commerce shakes the zone like a vast hive. It is own imports, unlimited, which consists of Marvy and Life the Unlucky, had latched on to the KY deal. Marvy had been in Inner Zone since the year before one, as he put it. He had been retired from some unspecified position in the State Department for the good of the service. Obviously, he had once been very good-looking in a crew-cut college boy way, but his face had sagged and formed lumps under the chin like melting paraffin. He was getting heavy around the hips. Life the Unlucky was a tall, thin Norwegian with a patch over one eye. His face congealed in a permanent, ingratiating smirk. Behind him lay an epic saga of unsuccessful enterprises. He had failed at raising frogs, chinchilla, Siamese fighting fish, Ramian culture pearls. He had attempted, variously and without success, to promote the lovebird to in a coffin cemetery, to corner the condom market during the rubber shortage, to run a mail-order whorehouse, to issue penicillin as a patent medicine. He had followed disastrous betting systems in the casinos of Europe and the racetracks of the U.S. His reverses in business were matched by the incredible mischances of his personal life. His front teeth had been stomped out by bestial American sailors in Brooklyn. Vultures had eaten out an eye when he drank a pint of paragoric and passed out in a Panama City park. He had been trapped between floors in an elevator for five days with an oil-burning junk habit and sustained an attack of DTs while stowing away in a footlocker. 
Then there was the time he collapsed with strangulated intestines, perforated ulcers, and peritonitis. In Cairo, and the hospital was so crowded they bedded him in the latrine. And the Greek surgeon goofed and sewed up a live monkey in him, and he was gang-fucked by the Arab attendants. And one of the orderlies stole the penicillin, substituting Saniflush. At the time he got clap in his ass, and a self-righteous English doctor cured him with an enema of hot sulfuric acid. The examination. Carl Peterson found a postcard in his box requesting him to report for a 10 o'clock appointment with Dr. Benway in the Ministry of Mental Hygiene and Prophylaxis. What on earth could they want with me, he thought irritably. A mistake, most likely. But he knew they didn't make mistakes. Certainly not mistakes of identity. Carl entered the steel enamel labyrinth of the ministry, strode to the information desk, and presented his card. Fifth floor, room 26. In room 26, a nurse looked at him with cold undersea eyes. Dr. Benway is expecting you, she said, smiling. Go right in, as if he had nothing to do but wait for me, thought Carl. The office was completely silent and filled with a milky light. The doctor shook Carl's hand, keeping his eyes on the young man's chest. I've seen this man before, Carl thought, but where? He sat down and crossed his legs. He glanced at an ashtray on the desk and lit a cigarette. He turned to the doctor, a steady, inquiring gaze in which there was more than a touch of insolence. The doctor seemed embarrassed. He fidgeted and <coughs> coughed and fumbled with papers. <coughs> he said finally, Your name is uh, Carl Peterson, I believe. His glasses slid down onto his nose in parody of the academic manner. Carl nodded silently. The doctor did not look at him, but seemed nonetheless to register the acknowledgement. He pushed his glasses back into place with one finger and opened a file on the white enamel desk. Um, Carl Peterson. He repeated the name caressingly. First, his lips and nodded several times. He spoke again abruptly. You know, of course, we are trying. We are all trying. Sometimes, of course, we don't succeed. His voice trailed off thin and tenuous. He put a hand to his forehead. To adjust the state, simply a tool, to the needs of each individual citizen. His voice boomed out so unexpectedly deep and loud that Carl started. That is the only function of the state, as we see it, our knowledge, incomplete, of course. He made a slight gesture of depreciation. For example, for example, Take the matter of a sexual deviation. The doctor rocked back and forth in his chair. His glasses slid down onto his nose. Carl felt suddenly uncomfortable. Frankly, we don't pretend to understand, at least not completely, why some men and women prefer the uh, sexual company of their own sex. We do know 
that the uh, phenomena is common enough and under certain circumstances a matter of uh, concern to this department. Treatment of these disorders is at the present time <coughs> symptomatic. The doctor suddenly threw himself back in his chair and burst into peals of metallic laughter. Ha! 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 Carl watched him appalled. The man is insane, he thought. The doctor's face went blank as a gambler's. Carl felt an odd sensation in his stomach, like the sudden stopping of an elevator. The doctor was studying the file in front of him. He spoke in a tone of slightly condescending amusement. Don't look so frightened, young man. Just a professional joke. To say a treatment is symptomatic means there is none. Except to make the patient feel as comfortable as possible. And that is precisely what we attempt to do in these cases. Once again, Carl felt the impact of that cold interest on his face. That is to say, reassurance when reassurance is necessary. And, of course, suitable outlets with other individuals of similar tendencies. No isolation is indicated. The condition is no more directly contagious than cancer. Cancer, my first love. The doctor's voice receded. He seemed actually to have gone away through an invisible door, leaving his empty body sitting there at the desk. And so, Carl, you will please oblige to tell me how many times and under what circumstances you have uh, indulged in homosexual acts. His voice drifts away. If you have never done so, I should be inclined to think of you as somewhat a typical young man. <laughs> the doctor raises a coy, admonishing finger. In any case, he tapped the file and flashed a hideous leer. Carl noticed that the file was six inches thick. In fact, it seemed to have thickened enormously since he entered the room. Well, when I was doing my military service, these queers used to proposition me, and sometimes when I was blank. <laughs> yes, of course, Carl, the doctor prayed hardly. In your position, I would have done the same. I don't mind telling you. <laughs> Well, I guess we can uh, dismiss as irrelevant these uh, understandable means of replenishing the uh, exchequer. <laughs> and now, Carl, there were perhaps one finger tapped the file, which gave out a faint effluvia of moldy jock straps and chlorine. Occasions. When no economic factors were involved, a green flare exploded in Carl's brain. He saw Hans's lean brown body twisting towards him, quick breath on his shoulder. The flare went out. Some huge insect was squirming in his hand, his whole being jerked away in an electric spasm of revulsion. Carl got to his feet, shaking with rage. What are you writing there, he demanded. Do you often doze off like that in the middle of a conversation? I wasn't asleep, that is. You weren't? It's just that the whole thing is unreal. I'm going now. I don't care. You can't force me to stay. He was walking across the room towards the door. 
He had been walking a long time. A creeping numbness dragged his legs. The door seemed to recede. Where can you go, girl? The doctor's voice reached him from a great distance. Out, away, through the door. The green door, girl. The doctor's voice was barely audible. The whole room was exploding out into space. Have you seen Pentapon Rose? The gangster in concrete rolls down the river channel. They cowboyed him in the steam room. Is this cherry ass Gio the towel boy? Our mother Gillig, old auntie of Westminster Place. Only dead fingers talk in Braille. The Mississippi rolls great limestone boulders down the silent alley. Distant rumble of stomachs, poison pigeons rain from the northern lights. The reservoirs are empty. Brass statues crash through the hungry squares and alleys of the gaping city. Probing for a vein in the junk sick morning, strictly from cough syrup, a thousand junkies storm the crystal spine clinics, cook down the gray ladies. In the limestone cave, met a man with Medusa's head in a hat box and said, Be careful to the customs inspector. Frozen forever, hand an inch from the false bottom. <laughs> <laughs> 